Let me tell you a story. It's a fish story. Once upon a time, there was a nation, a nation that had been founded as a maritime nation. It was a leading shipbuilder and a leading shipper. Those days are gone. It can no longer build the largest ocean-going vessels, and few ships that enter or leave its major ports carry its flag. But it remains a leader in ocean research and technology. In many ways, that nation is the envy of the world. It is a nation with a strong economy, a leader in technology, a nation that is a leader in the development of modern medicine. It is a nation to which other nations send their best and brightest to attend graduate school to get advanced degrees. It has sent men to the moon and brought them back and has sent instruments to other planets in our solar system. But it is a nation not without problems. More than 35% of its residents are obese. They eat too much fast food and processed foods and not enough fruits and vegetables and not enough seafood. I digress. This is a fish story. In a sense, it's about shooting fish in a barrel because this nation has a great opportunity when it comes to fish. It is a nation that imports more than 91% of its seafood by value. It manages its wild capture fisheries as well as any nation on Earth, but grows little seafood, particularly fin fish in the ocean, less than 5% of what it consumes. It has some of the best marine aquaculturists in the world, people with expertise in how to farm the sea responsibly, experts who have created new feeds, feeds with less fish meal, feeds that utilize fish waste and plant material, new feed delivery systems that essentially eliminate overfeeding and the accumulation of uneaten feed on the seafloor under the cages. It has other experts who have come up with new and better designs for cages to minimize escapes, and experts who have developed sophisticated hydrodynamic models for sighting pens and cages to minimize environmental impact models that are used around the world, but only rarely in their own nation. Sadly, there's little market for their skills and technologies in their own country, because the social and political climate is cool towards offshore finfish aquaculture. So they export the advances they have made to other nations that employ them with great success. Those nations get the jobs and the economic benefits of aquaculture. And this nation, well, it buys most of its seafood from them, creating a seafood trade deficit approaching $14 billion a year, up from seven to $8 billion only a decade ago. In some cases, this nation even sends young hatchery-grown fish to other nations, where they grow them up to market size in their offshore farms, and then buys them back. Think of the carbon footprint of these practices. This nation was characterized recently by the United Nations as the nation with the greatest potential to be a world leader in marine aquaculture. It has the largest exclusive economic zone of any nation on Earth, and much of it has oceanographic conditions favorable to developing a thriving offshore aquaculture industry. According to the UN, Using marine aquaculture, this nation could produce an amount of seafood equivalent to all the wild capture seafood from the entire world ocean in an area about the size of the state of Vermont. Less than four-tenths of one percent of this nation's EEZ. It's a dilemma, a puzzle. Why this nation, so enlightened in so many areas, is so reluctant when it comes to offshore aquaculture particularly when 91% of the seafood it consumes is imported. More than half is farm-raised, and much of it is at risk of being unavailable in the near future. The middle class in China, its major exporter, is growing. Their love for seafood is strong, and they will be able to buy much of the seafood they now export. Why is this nation so reticent to endorse offshore marine aquaculture, you ask? 
It is a nation where it takes large numbers of people to make things happen, but relatively small but noisy groups of people can stop things from happening. This is both good and bad. In this case, it's bad. A small but very vocal group of citizens is opposed to offshore aquaculture. They remember and recite the horror stories, many of which were true, of the problems aquaculture had in its early days, from poor siting of facilities, overstocking of cages, overfeeding, escapees, excessive use of growth hormones and antibiotics, and destruction of habitat. But they fail to have learned, or at least to tell, that recent advances have eliminated most of these problems. Advances such as feeds that require less fish meal from wild stocks, vaccines that minimize the use of antibiotics, and improved husbandry practices that greatly reduce impacts on the surrounding ecosystems. And many of those advances have come from scientists right in their own country, and that environmentally responsible aquaculture is far more environmentally benign than their own agricultural practices, particularly than the growing of animal livestock for protein, and that seafood protein is far healthier than red meat. In fact, this nation's major health organizations have recommended that its residents, all ages, both sexes, double their consumption of seafood. Since fisheries experts tell us that wild stocks cannot increase by much, it will have to come from sustainable aquaculture. Often the opponents of offshore finfish aquaculture frame their opposition in their concern for the effects it would have on the ocean and on marine life. By now, you know which nation I refer to. It is the United States of America. I live in a state in that nation that has a great untapped opportunity in offshore fin fish aquaculture. But to date, vocal public opposition and bureaucratic ineptitude have stopped offshore fin fish aquaculture dead in its tracks. The California State Aquaculture Development Act states, quote, the legislature finds and declares that it is in the interest of the people of the state that the practice of aquaculture be encouraged. It was first stated in 1979 and reaffirmed as recently as 2015. But the state also has a statute that prohibits the leasing of any sea bottom in state waters for finfish aquaculture until the state has completed a Programmatic Environmental Impact Review, PEIR. This makes sense, but the process to complete that PEIR began more than a decade ago, in 2003, and it has yet to be completed. Why not move just a little farther offshore, outside of state waters and into federal waters? The administrator of NOAA, Dr. Catherine Sullivan, recently stated in February 2015, quote, it's very clear that U.S. aquaculture is a job creator in coastal communities. Aquaculture is a bright spot and one that we need to continue to nurture. Moving a little farther offshore, just beyond the three mile state limit would seem to be the answer. But it's not so easy there either. Jurisdiction is split among a number of federal agencies. The nation's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has the lead for the nation in nurturing conditions that would allow for the development of smart aquaculture, but they don't have the authority to issue a permit and must have the consent of a number of other federal agencies, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and even the U.S. Navy. A study by the University of California at Santa Barbara has shown that a significant amount of the area of California is suitable for aquaculture and would not conflict with marine protected areas, shipping lanes, and other uses. An investor has committed several tens of millions of dollars for a proposed finfish operation off the coast of Southern California in federal waters. It will grow only native species. It can serve as an experimental model to test concerns and lay fears. 
the environmental standards it will be held to and the monitoring to ensure compliance with those standards will be stringent. If it's successful, it might open opportunities for other offshore fin fish operations. But then that's a concern of some. It's the proverbial concern about the yellowfin snoot in the tent, the equivalent of the camel's nose in the tent. That brings me to a question I often am asked. How can you, as the director of a major aquarium, be an advocate for open ocean fin fish aquaculture? I thought you were dedicated to ocean conservation. My answer is always the same. It is because we are dedicated to the conservation of marine life and marine ecosystems that we are strong advocates for environmentally responsible offshore fin fish aquaculture. And because I live in and love California, it is why I believe California should be a major player and take a lead role in showing how to do it and do it in an environmentally responsible way, one consistent with California's strong ocean ethic. The Aquarium of the Pacific is dedicated to the conservation of marine life and marine ecosystems and to using the ocean responsibly for public benefit.